uh, welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. Um, I'm going to slowly go ahead and get started as usual. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight's going to be part five of our look at the Manifestation of Lights Sutra. Um, I'm going to start tonight, like I just said, I'm going to kind of ease this into this evening. Um, I'm going to do a quick review of part one through four, just so we kind of remember what's going on here with this sutra. Um, and then we're going to start uh, looking at some more verses. Um, so we have kind of two things. I have two ideas or two things <clears throat> planned for us. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is how funny this sutra is and i know it doesn't seem very funny uh but i think tonight when we get to the ne the next section uh i'm hoping to share with you a little bit of humor or what i find to be humorous about buddhist sutras uh and then the next the second thing i have in store for us tonight is actually some really some heavy dharma so we're going to finally get into some some really deep heavy dharma tonight i know the last few sessions we've just sort of been listening to this very long poem that is this sutra um but it's all been kind of building up to something in a way um and so let me just remind you of what this sutra is all about very quickly um so it's an odd sutra um and it has a lot of themes from other sutras but unto itself this is a very odd little sutra and so it begins with this little boy, this what they call a young boy named Moonlight, who asks the Buddha how he acquired all of these different lights. And the little boy Moonlight, he lists all of these different kinds of lights that the Buddha emits or manifests as the title of the sutra goes. And if you remember from part one, where I read the list of questions or the, the list of lights, a handful of those were what we would call regular light, like colored light, red light, blue light, green light. And, but then there was all kinds of other lights that may or may not be perceptible to the human eye. So I spent the first uh, session, session one, basically just talking about the theme of light in Buddhism um, and that even though they are talking about this light, it may not be helpful to think of it as like photonic light, that there are different ways of understanding luminosity, luminousness. And so in part one, we just sort of like dealt with the theme of light in Buddhism. And then in part two, we really started to read the Buddha's answer to the young boy Moonlight. And the first part of the Buddha's answer, and I want to remind you the whole sutra is in uh, poetic verse. It's in a particular uh, meter, I mean, particular kind of uh, syllables, if you will, per line, has a certain rhyme scheme. Um, and certain lines per, uh, I guess, what we would call stanzas in that way. So it's all very uh, metrical. And in the Buddha's first series of about 100 verses, he describes all of these different kinds of lights and the practices or the qualities that he cultivated in order to be able to emit that type of light. And so it was, uh, this was part two, where we were talking about the way this sutra couples, where it was coupling these different practices, practices of uh, the merit acquisition, generosity, loving kindness, compassion, the, the normal uh, activities of a, of a bodhisattva or of a Buddha, but then they were coupled with these wonderful ideas of these different lights. Then in the third session, the Buddha shifted, actually he changes his rhyme scheme, he changes the meter, and begins to talk about all of these other lights. But the Buddha talked about them in this way that they 
each have a different name. And if somebody were to remember the name of that light or recall the name of that light, that they too could possess these qualities such as fearlessness, uh, immovability, imperturbability, all of these ideas. So that was sort of the first three parts. And then last week, we continued to read further. And last week is where the sutra really started to get a little, little weird. The Buddha stopped talking about all of these different lights and then proceeded to tell young moonlight a story about kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago that there was a Buddha named Supreme. And in the world in which that Buddha Supreme lived, there was a king uh, named Joyful Bo Voice who gave all of these offerings to that Buddha named Supreme, offering all these gardens and all of these flowers and all these parasols. And then the Buddha says, and guess what, Moonlight? That king named Joyful Voice who gave all those offerings to the Buddha, that was you. And also in that story, the Buddha says that that Buddha Supreme taught this sutra, the Manifestation of Lights Sutra, and he taught it to King Joyful Voice. And it was because King Joyful Voice had heard this sutra already. And since the young boy Moonlight was the King Joyful Voice, he had already heard this sutra. And so this is where the, this, this manifestation of Light Sutra, this, this manifestation of Light Sutra, it's where this manifestation of Light Sutra started to get a little weird in that way, where it seemed to be talking about past lives, but in a way collapsing time and space in that way. So it was just getting a little pretty weird in that sense. And again, I want to remind you that we had been talking about all these different lights, and then the Buddha drifted off into this, uh, well, I don't even know, again, well, I don't know what you would call it, a story, a, a kind of fortune telling, because he was kind of reading the past lives of this boy Moonlight. Anyways, the idea is, is that that's a theme in some of these Mahayana sutras, the theme being that the Buddha has taught this sutra before. The classic example that I always give is the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra is a good example of this where the sutra, when you read it, it talks about an earlier time where this sutra was given, but then starts talking about wherever and whenever this sutra is given, there is a Buddha. So this theme of these sutras having lives, lives, lives of their own is sort of what we encountered last week. And then we kind of got to a point where, and it was only right at the end. And so it's kind of where I'm going to pick up and start tonight. But then the very last thing that we read, it was kind of the conclusion of that. Um, and I think I'm going to mainly just read from the book tonight. Um, I will refer to my translation every now and then, but um, so the very last thing that we read or that I read was, um, so you, Moonlight, should know that King Joyful Voice, who made the various offerings to the Tathagata, was none other than you. And since you heard this sutra in the past, you now ask me about it once again. Only those who have pure faith in the Dharma can expound or explain this sutra. After my Padi Nirvana, so after the passing away of the Buddha, when the Dharma wheel is about to cease turning, one who expounds this sutra in the future will be a protector of the Dharma, just as a good caravan leader is called the guardian of the valuables. 
so that's I didn't read that very last line last time, but I read the the line before that, which was this idea about somebody in the future explaining or expounding this sutra. <laughs> that that that's going on right now. <laughs> that this is that event. And so that's where last week I kind of mentioned this weird, almost kind of breaking of the fourth wall, as they say, the, the sutra does, where the sutra kind of almost reaches out to you, the reader, and brings you into that. And especially when it's a, um, like a Dharma class like this, where you have somebody actually explaining a sutra, and then the sutra is talking about somebody explaining the sutra. It, it just gets very recursive or uh, self-referential in that way. So I, the, I wanted to remind you of that because the sutra is taking us on a journey and all of a sudden the sutra has arrived at this present moment that we're in right now. And so let's now read ahead so again, that was just a quick, very quick recap of the sutra. And well, actually, let me just read the next part and the next two stanzas. So then the Buddha says, in times to come, in, in this translation, they even translate it as in the end times, which I don't quite know if it, the sutra warrants such apocalyptic ideas of the end times versus the idea of later on down the road. But just let it be known, you could read it as in the end times or just later on. One who expounds this sutra in the future, later on, right? Or sorry, in the coming times, one who hears this sutra and enjoys it at once. That person should know that they are inspired by the awesome spiritual powers of the Buddha and that, and that they receive the blessings of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. All of a sudden, they mention Manjushri. Very strange. And then it says, merely hearing this sutra is tantamount to meeting many Buddhas who bestow upon the listener of this sutra secret instructions and wisdom as well. <laughs> okay. So that's again just this interesting reference to what's happening here, what's happening now. And then I want to, before I read this next line, and this will be, this will introduce sort of the next series of poems or uh, stanzas, I should say. So when I first read this sutra and I was getting ready for uh, maybe doing it on Sunday nights, when I was reading the beginning of this sutra, I was saying to myself, mm, not sure if I should do this sutra. I'm not sure this is going to be everybody's uh, favorite sutra. Like I knew that it was kind of a little different. It didn't have quite the um, uh, exposition that we're used to in that way. But then I got to this section and I laughed so hard when I got to this point that I was like, I've got to do this sutra. It's too funny. So this next section, and I do want to talk about, about it a little bit, but I want to read a few of these, and then we're going to go back and analyze them a little bit. So it's starting to talk about this idea about somebody who hears this sutra, right? And it said, if somebody hears this sutra and they're delighted, right, that that's because of this awesome spiritual power of the Buddha that they're delighted, right? And then it goes on to say, one who is gentle, straightforward, and always makes offerings to the Buddhas and who practices the teaching of no self and is also kind and patient. This person will love this sutra. One who bears malice 
insatiably seeks selfish gains and has no aspiration for peace and tranquility, this person will not like this sutra. <laughs> One who makes offerings to Tathagatas comprehends the profound, wonderful Dharma and has pure faith in the true wisdom of the Buddha, this person will love this sutra. One who is distracted and impure in mind, enslaved by evil passions, indulges in killing, and is hard to subdue, this person will not like this sutra. <laughs> One who enjoys living alone in a hermitage, or actually it says in a forest, with peace of mind, detach from worldly gain, even from kinsmen. This person will love this sutra. One who follows bad company, corrupts their own mind and the minds of others, loses their dhyana practice and breaks the precepts or regresses away from the precepts. This person will not like this sutra. <laughs> One who has very pure aspirations often observes dharmas carefully with wisdom and is guarded by many spiritual friends. This person will love this sutra. One who is attached to their friends, kinsmen, and household members, providing fruits and flowers to appease them and has a mind not straightforward but a devious mind, this person will not like this sutra. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pause there, make a note. Okay, so when I first read that, I laughed because the sutra recognizes that this is really not everybody's cup of tea in that way. Now, it's kind of being a little, heavy handed in that way by saying, you know, it's only sort of certain people that are really like this sutra, other people that are not going to really enjoy this sutra. But I think it's just a, a very, very funny part of the sutra. Like, I think it's meant to be funny in that way. The one thing that I wanted to draw your attention to just because of where we're going to go this evening. So the very first one of these, um, these, uh, love the sutra, won't like the sutra. The first one was one who is gentle and straightforward, always makes offerings to the Buddhas and practices the teaching of no self, being kind and patient. This person will love this sutra. So that's the first one of these. And there's been a few references here and there in this sutra to some more uh, profound dharmas, if you will. But this is sort of the first mention of a very profound dharma, which is the practice of this idea of no self in that way. So this, of course, is basic Buddhism, right? This is sort of a very, very basic fundamental teachings, teaching of Buddhism. And because of where this is going regarding that idea, I just wanted to spend a moment to mention kind of, or just to make clear what we're talking about. When we talk about what, what does it mean for somebody to practice the teaching of no self? So there's a lot of ways, of course, to understand the teaching of no self. Uh, normally it would be called the teaching of anatman, Anatman or anatta in Pali might be used to that word. And what's tricky, you know, is that this idea of no self, it, it, first of all, it has a lot of different kind of meanings in a way, not just in Buddhism, but then outside of Buddhism, there's different teachers that teach this idea different ways. And then even myself, I teach this idea different ways, sort of depending upon the context, depending on the specific sutra, because it actually kind of has slightly different connotations. Um, the one that I want to kind of, I want to just remind you of 
it's a way that I kind of think of no self or a way that I present no self. It's, it's one of those ones that's always very tricky to explain when it's actually, it's not the tricky, it, it, it is tricky to explain, but it's, well, let me just explain or try to explain. So the idea is, is that we have a notion of ourselves and there's a lot of ways to understand that self. We talk about, at least like kind of in, in the modern, in the modern world, we would talk about a socially constructed self as an example, where my identity, my sense of self, it includes my first name, which is what kind of people call me. My sense of identity includes my last name, which ties me to my family and specifically my mother in that sense regarding my birth in that way. My marital status is a part of my identity in that way that I'm a husband, my occupation teacher in that sense. So I'm identify with my teacher or sorry, identify with my occupation as a teacher. I occupy with, uh, identify with my name, my family, marital status. And then we could go on and on and on with all kinds of things that I identify with. Now, what's the presumption there <laughs> is this me that's doing the identifying with all of those different things, this, this, the presumption, the uh, assumption, the pre-assumption, presumption of this Michael who, oh wait, but I don't get to use that Michael because that's one of the identifiers that the self is identifying with, with the name, with that. So what I'm getting at is, is that if you start to look for the self, even just moment that you just start the pursuit to try to find this self, you all automatically start to realize it's a little like, well, wait a minute, what exactly are we referring to? What exactly would I be referring to when I say I, identify with my occupation. I identify with my name. I, what is that I? Especially if we say I identify with this physical body. I don't identify with this space over here. I don't identify with my cell phone. I identify as that, that this is me. And there it is again. The presumption of this me that identifies. So I'm not the body, I identify with the body, just like I identify with my occupation and my marital status. But again, what is that I that is doing that, identifying? So that's what we're interested in, kind of from a Buddhist point of view is that, not in this sense for tonight's Dharma talk, not what I'm identifying with, but the identifier, the one who identifies in that way, who or what is that? Point to, point to it, right? But it's a little deeper than that, or at least let me give you a, a deeper way to think about it. So my understanding of the self that the Buddhists are saying there isn't one, my understanding of that self is the way that I, the, the way that I describe it is it's the idea or the notion of the experiencer of one's life. And what I mean by that is, is that we have this notion that when we were a baby, even though the physical body was very different, and even though everything was very, very, very different, I have this sense that I was the baby and that I experienced being in my baby crib. I experienced being hungry and crying for my mother at night. I was the baby. 
And then I was the one that grew up and went to elementary school. And I was the one that went to college. Then I was the one that got married. And I am the one talking to you here now. And I will be the one here next week. The idea is, is that even though there's been a lot of growth and change and all of that, there's the notion that the whole time I've been there being the receiver, the recipient of all of these experiences. And again, even though the body has changed a lot, the mind has changed a lot, everything has changed a lot. I still have this idea that that was me there then. And then there, and then there, and then of course me here now, and I'll be here next week. And so the self is this idea of an entity, for lack of a better term, an entity that is the receiver of all these experiences. And what Buddhism is suggesting, what the Buddha, one of the aspects of the awakening of the Buddha, is that that is actually a notion, a a notion of this current experience. So this current experience can think of this that way. It can, as, as I kind of put it, you can interpret this experience through the lens of that self and you will get a, a deep sense of identity with that being. And you will get a deep sense of identity with that being, but Again, what we're really interested in is a careful observation, a careful looking for what is it that we're exactly talking about when we say me. And again, especially when we do it over time, when we used to be this big and this big, and now we're, I'm this big. And so again, if it's not the physical body that is the self, what then what is this <laughs> and you can kind of just continue to pursue it and of course western psychology and even western science in a way is still pursuing the self in a sense whereas 2500 years ago the buddha awakened to the oh wow there just isn't that entity even though i know it seems like there is but the idea is there just isn't that entity in, th in that sense. And so there is this ever-evolving, ever-changing process and ever-evolving, ever-changing experience that can interpret this experience in a variety of ways. And just to kind of round this out, because again, I think this will be helpful as we move forward tonight. An, an example that I like to give regarding how it could steam like there's a self and there actually isn't one. An example I like to give to clarify how that could be, I've given, I've given it recently, but never hurts to do it again. A good example or a good way to think about it is a kind of panic attack or an anxiety attack where you start to think that maybe like everybody's conspiring against you or if you hear something outside, they're coming to get you, or if the phone rings, it's, you know, it's about you and it's bad, or any number of aspects to a, a good old fashioned anxiety attack, right? What I want you to think about though, is how it is that if, you know, and if you've never had a anxiety or panic attack, I hope you've never experienced that ever, but if you've had one or have heard about one, the idea is, is that when you're in that mode, you, you think they're coming to get you. You think that, that all of this is really, really happening. And then of course you kind of maybe, you know, you, the next morning you wake up and you realize, oh, wow, it, it wasn't all about me. They weren't coming to get me. It wasn't at all what I thought it was. But it sure seemed like it at the time, but I was actually delusional. I was, I was actually, it was a, a delusion in that sense. So that idea is, is that during that panic anxiety attack, 
the sense of self, uh, as I say, the, the dial on that has been turned all the way up to 10, all the way up to 11. And it's as if everything is about you. Every noise, every sound, every movement is being interpreted through this lens of self. And, and therefore, having the experience that it is truly about you, you, and they are coming to get you. And so you panic. And so all of the emotional experience is real. And even, you know, if you hear a knock at the door, you might run and hide because you think, oh, they're coming to get me to take me away when it's not at all, but you thought it was. And so you ran and hid and made it about that. And so again, the idea was, is that your sense of self was turned up to 11 and you were interpreting everything through that. The Buddha or Buddhism is suggesting that the kind of normal basic mode of being, the dial is around five, five or four. And the idea is, is that you could actually turn that dial down and actually click it off to where you're not interpreting every experience through the lens of self at all and what i want you to kind of start to feel is how in the panic attack mode it sure seemed real and even was real like if you know what i mean like you heard the knock at the door and you ran away because they were coming to get you and at least when that was happening it, there was a reality to it. But again, in the morning, you realize, ah, I was totally delusional. Again, Buddhism suggesting the same thing about this experience, that it is as if we're a little still panicked, still anxious. And so we're interpreting this experience a certain way. And then that way, which is through the lens of the self, is going to be clouded. That lens is going to be cloudy with a bunch of hangings on from the past guilt shame all of that kind of stuff that we bring from that past self and then of course stress and worry about the future self which you get to have all of that when you have this sense of self that stretches from time through time like that so the idea is is that the one who practices the teaching of no self well, they'll love this sutra, the Buddha says. But the idea is, is that that's an allusion to that practice. And the idea is, is that that becomes a practice to observe how it could be that this self is an interpretation, a way to feel about these events, a way to experience these events, but maybe not necessarily the only way. In that sense, maybe not only, maybe not the right, correct way. In that, that might be. Okay, everybody feeling okay about the teaching of no self? Anything? Because again, it's just where we're headed. I wanted that to be very, you know, present on our minds. So let's read a few more of these before we shift gears. So one who always recalls the blessings of the Buddha cherishes all wonderful good roots and sincerely dedicates them to the attainment of enlightenment. This person will love this sutra. If one is infatuated with women, bedecks themselves with splendid attire, or you could read it if one is infatuated with women who bedeck themselves with splendid attire, and one who longs to play with them, that person will not like this sutra. One who is earnest, relies on nothing, is not defiled by any passions, and never flatters anyone for the sake of food or drink, this person will love this sutra. One who teaches sentient beings that carnal desires is not full of faults. One who teaches by slandering the Buddha, or sorry, one who teaches by slandering the Buddha's past, present, and future, this person will not like this sutra. 
one who holds fast or firm to their faith and aspiration for enlightenment seeks the Dharma vigorously and is never weary or negligent, this person will love this sutra. And one who sits quietly in a mountain grove, attaining purity through the cultivation of wisdom without craving for food, clothing, or any need of the body, this person will love this sutra. Okay, so that reaches sort of, we're still going to be going with the, some people will love this sutra, some people will not like this sutra. So we're still going to be going back and forth with those, but everything's about to get a little more profound in that sense. So the next one says, one who is bewildered or another translation, always confused and does not understand the past and future states of the I is a fool trapped by Mara's lasso. <laughs> this person will not delight in this sutra. One who clearly understands the past and future states of the I is free of Mara's lassos, and this person will love this sutra. Okay, so this begins a long section. Um, it's not too, too long, but it'll take us through probably the uh, end of tonight. And it's a very kind of long, deep session about the nature of the I, right? So. We are about to take this kind of deep dharmic journey into the nature of the physical I. And before we even go through this, I want you to know that at the end of this, it does say, and I'll read it when we get there, but it does say, and everything we just said regarding the I goes for the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, as well. So I just want you to know that we are going to be focusing on the I, but it's everything's going to be included in the logic that we're about to walk through. But I don't think it is, you know, that I don't think it should be go entirely unnoticed that there is this long section that we're about to read that's on the I or on the eyeballs in that way since we're dealing with the suture that's about light, right? So I just, I really, really can't emphasize enough the significance of everything that is about to be read concerning the eye, and then knowing that this is a whole suture about light. So the first of these is this idea about, oh, and by the way, the language of all of these that we're, I'm about to read, it's all exactly the same language. One who is bewildered and doesn't understand this about the eye is caught in Mara's lasso. And then one who clearly understands this particular thing about the eye is freed from Mara's lasso. And so, of course, Mara is this kind of embodiment of greed, anger, and delusion, or I should say personification of greed, anger, and delusion, kind of the devil in Buddhism but we understand that it's just the personification of greed, anger, and delusion. And then this, this term Mara's lasso is a particularly nice one. I hadn't really seen that term before. Uh, so this idea of being caught by Mara's uh, net, or the, but the particular word is a lasso. So, okay. So those are the elements to all of these. Somebody who clearly understands all of this versus somebody who's confused about it being caught in Mara's lasso versus being freed from Mara's lasso. And the first is this idea of one who is bewildered and doesn't understand the past and future states of the I. So the other way, and this is where I wanna uh, start to refer to my translation. So, 
Where is it? So the words that are actually kind of used in the uh, original Chinese that these are being translated from, it's about if someone is bewildered and confused as to the past and future limits of the I. So the, the one, the standard edition that I usually read from is about the, um, the past and future states of the I, but the word isn't about necessarily the states, but about the limits of the I in regarding the past and the future. So a lot of different ways to understand that, but because of where this is going, meaning, so for, for example, the next one is about somebody who doesn't understand the existence and non-existence of the I, one who doesn't understand the destruction of the I, like, we're, we're going through these different aspects of the physicality of the eye. And so this first one is about, well, there's a, there's a great uh, a Zen saying about what did your face look like before you were born? And it's, it's a koan. It's not meant to have an answer. It's actually meant to provoke the thinker into, well, in this case, this koan is very much about the, I don't quite want to say the unimaginable exactly, but it's about that idea of, you know, imagining that which hasn't come into existence yet. It's, it's very difficult to do in that way. Or an, an example that I, I sometimes used to give is this one about, I have this little treasure box. Do you want what's in it? And the idea is, is well, I, you don't know what's in it because you haven't seen it, you haven't heard it, you haven't smelt it, you haven't tasted it, you haven't touched it. And I haven't really given you much to even think about. So that thing, you have no qualities to go on. And so it's an interesting thing to try to think about, right? That which is unthinkable in a sense. So this is sort of the nature of what we're talking about, which is sort of about, you know, what did your eyes look like before you were born? That's the limit, the past limit of the eye is talking about sort of this idea of, before you were born, before you had eyes, what color were your eyes? <laughs> right? Well, they hadn't, they hadn't come into existence yet. So that's the idea of the past limit of the eye. And then the idea of the future limit of the eye, the idea that there'll be that moment or that time when they go out of existence. And then beyond that, what color are your eyes? <laughs> so this is gonna get subtle. I'm gonna do, as always, I'm gonna do my best to try to explain it, at least how I understand it. But this first one is about that. But I want you to catch something. It says in this translation, one who is bewildered and doesn't understand the past and future states of the I, or one who is always confused, unable to understand the past and future limits of the I. That person is a fool caught in Mara's lasso and will not like this sutra, but one who clearly understands that I, the past and future limit of the I, that person will like, love this sutra. What I want you to kind of catch, and it's not entirely clear because the, the language here is, is tricky. They're not saying, or at least I don't understand it as saying, one who... So this is, this. <laughs> I don't know quite how to put this. This sutra 
is about to challenge that very idea of the I. And what I mean by that is, is the idea that there was no I, and then I was born and I had eyes and I have eyes. And then there'll be a time when I die and then I won't have eyes. And so there's this period of duration. This sutra is going to negate that. This sutra is going to be like, nah, -uh. <laughs> basically there is no I. So there's, there's no I at, to begin with is where this is going. Yeah, I should probably just tell you that now so that this will be make my life easier. So this is where that's going, is this sort of emptiness realization of no I. So when it says, one who's bewildered about the past and future of the I, the idea is that, so somebody who doesn't, who's like confused about how the physical I and doesn't clearly understand their past and future, they're caught, but one who does understand the past and future of the I. And what it's not saying yet is one who understands the lack of past and future of the I in that sense. So it's gonna get clearer though, as we go along. So, and we might have cause or we might have reason to come back to this one, but let's keep moving forward. So one who is bewildered and doesn't understand the existence and non-existence of the I is a fool caught in Mara's lasso and will not like the sutra. But one who clearly understands the existence and non-existence of the I is freed of Mara's lassos and will love the sutra. So that is very, very similar to what we were just talking about. I even evoked those ideas of the time before I had eyes, the time I have eyes, the time when I won't have eyes in that sense. That's, this is the existence of the eyes. Before they were born in that sense, that was the non-existence and the non-existence. Again, I think the way to read that is one who understands the existence and non-existence of the I, that person will love this sutra. I would suggest, and again, I am just giving you the flash forward in that way. The idea is, is that, remember when I gave you the example of the panic attack a little while ago and I, I was emphasizing this idea that when it's happening, it's real. But when we wake up the next morning, we realize it wasn't real. That's the space of the existence and non-existence of these things. There's, it's, a, it's more subtle. Within the world of Buddhism, things are way more subtle than just existent and non-existent. It's, it's about how things exist not necessarily whether they do or don't. And what I mean is, again, when we're having a panic attack or if you're having a hallucination or whatever it is, when it's happening, there's a reality to it, but it doesn't make it like real, real, real. That's the understanding, or again, how I understand this idea of somebody who's not confused about the existence and non-existence of the I. Somebody who is, confused about the existence and non-existence of the I, thinks there's no I, and now there's an I, and then there won't be an I. That's actually confusion about the existence and non-existence of the I. Everybody doing okay with all this? Great, wonderful. The next up. So one who is bewildered and doesn't understand the formation and destruction of the I is a fool caught in Mara's lassos and will not like this sutra. One who clearly understands the formation and destruction of the I is freed of Mara's lassos and will love this sutra. So the formation and destruction. 
So I hope you're sensing the theme of all of this, like that these are pertaining to these ideas that we have, which is about the idea of creation, existence, destruction, non-existence. So that's our kind of normal way of thinking about these things. In particular, it's the way that I think about my own existence, which is that there was a time when I didn't exist, then I was born, now I am, but this is all predicated under the idea of there will be a time when I won't be. And I actually, in a way, live my entire life through the lens of that understanding of there will be a time when I won't be. So I better get busy being, right? Because of this idea that I live with, that there will be a time when I won't be. Why do I have that notion that there will be a time that I won't be? Partially because I have this idea that there was a time when I wasn't. <laughs> Those two ideas are very related. And actually, what I would love to get you to see right now is how those two ideas, the idea that there are time when I wasn't, a time when I won't be, it's those ideas that are actually giving rise to this very sense I have of me being right now. It's what gives it that sense, that particular sense of existence. This right here, right now. This particular sense of being and existence is actually defined by my senses of non-existence, or at least my notions of not existing before this and not existing after this. How would I know I didn't exist before this? If, right? How would I, it's a very interesting question about where I get these ideas from, right? Where do I get these ideas that there was a time when I wasn't? and that there's a time when I won't be, right? So we don't need to answer these questions. What I would love to get you to see though is how they are so related in that way. Okay, and so this idea of existence or non-existence, right? This idea of the past and the future of the I, and then this third one, the formation and destruction of the I. So now we're getting into the real nitty gritty of, of this, by which I mean, not the time before and after, not the existence and non-existence of the I. Now we're talking about the formation of the I, right? And the idea of it coming together at a, like a cellular level, I suppose, in utero, I suppose, being formed, that idea of the forming of the eyeball. And then it's opposite, the idea of the decay of the eyeball, the destruction of the eyeball, right? One who clearly understands the formation and destruction of the eyeball will love this sutra. One who's confused about the formation and destruction of the eyeball will not like this sutra. Again, I would suggest that the normal way of thinking about the formation of eyeballs, which is at a cellular level in utero, that would actually be somebody who's confused about the formation and destruction of the eye in that sense. Okay, are we doing okay with those? So I believe this is where Oh no, we're coming up on it. So I have to refer to my translation. So I've mentioned this many, many times. This translation, they do this thing where they just leave stuff out. <laughs> they just don't share things with you, the reader. It's unfortunate. Um, this is one of the sections coming up where this happens a lot. They just, for some reason, I again, I don't even know why they uh, remove these things, but let me read to you the next part. So it's those three ideas about the I, the past and future of the I, existence, non existence, and then the formation and destruction. This is where it says, uh, actually, let me read mine. 
as it is, as it is with the eye, as well is it with the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, visible forms, sounds, scents, flavors, textures, and thoughts, earth, water, fire, air, substances, essences, events, beings, things, even suffering. The aggregates, realms, worlds, birth, the voice, names, truth, craving, hatred, delusion, pride, lust, deception, arrogance, greed, jealousy, flattery, exaggeration, all kinds of anger. You should know all of these are like this. Okay, let me, yeah, I'll pause there. So that section just said the, this thing, which basically, that section said, as well as with the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So that's all six sense organs. And it said this, you could basically substitute each of those. So somebody who's confused and bewildered about the past and future existence of the ear, about the past and future existence of the nose. So you could substitute all of those. But also, interestingly, you could substitute all of those other things, greed, anger, delusion. So one who is confused about the past and future of greed versus one who clearly understands the past and future of greed, the existence and non-existence of greed, the formation and destruction of greed. So it's kind of very interesting, actually, to go through all of those. But where I wanted to, why I wanted to pause was all of this might be sounding very familiar to you. <laughs> and what I mean is, is that if you're familiar with perhaps the most famous Buddhist sutra, the Heart Sutra, you will remember that a big chunk of that tiny little Heart Sutra is the idea of Shariputra. There's no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind, sight, sound, taste, touch, or thought, seeing, not even thinking, no, or, no suffering, origin, cessation, path, all of those things. The Heart Sutra says, within emptiness, there is no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain. So this sutra is, is really in the spirit right now. It's very much in the spirit of the Heart Sutra very much in that spirit of emptiness. And it's kind of why I was suggesting to you that the one who clearly understands the, the past and future of the I, which is to say that there is no past and future of the I, there is no formation and destruction of the I, there is no existence or non-existence of the I within the realm of emptiness. So, this sutra just did the same thing, but then took it even further um, with these beautiful ideas of not even truth, name, voice, any of these things, right? Okay. So now we get to the next part. Everybody still doing okay? Excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, so they left out a bunch of that. I, for some reason, they didn't, they didn't want you to know that exaggeration and flattery and a bunch of other things were also uh, empty. So they left those out. And then it picks back up with the eye and says, One who is bewildered 
and doesn't understand the ultimate exhaustion of the I falls to the level of common ordinary practices and will not love or will not like this sutra. One who clearly understands without confusion the ultimate exhaustion of the I has risen above the pra common ordinary practices. And this person will love this sutra. Okay, so we're gonna keep going with these ideas. The language has shifted a little bit. We're no longer caught or freed from Mara's lasso. Now it is about either being descending, actually the, the word is falling to the level of common ordinary practices or rising above common ordinary practices, all right? And the first one of these is about one who is bewildered or doesn't understand the exhaustion of the eye. So this is a technical term. Oh yeah, hi, Tony, sorry. I have a feeling you're going there, but I was gonna ask what exhaustion, like what is that? Yep. So the, so, Exhaustion is the best example is, or not the best example, but a clear example is a fire. And so let's say you're, you got a campfire and your campfire is burning and you got a big log there. And so it's burning. As the night goes on, the log burns up. And the moment that the flame goes out because there's no more fuel, meaning the log has been completely consumed, it's exhausted. It's, it's done, it's out, it's gone. And again, I wanna just kind of fill in some blanks for you here, but when it says one who it clearly understands and is without confusion regarding the ultimate exhaustion of the eye, the way to read that is about the, the, this idea, it's going to be really, really subtle, but it has to do with this idea that we have the notion that it, it, this goes along with everything I was saying before. We have the notion that my eyes have arisen and they are currently existing and that they're going to they're gonna fade out at some point and then be gone. And the way to understand the language of exhaustion is actually about that. Um, there, there's a very, very famous sutra called the Fire Sutra. And it's where the Buddha talks about the eyes are on fire. The ears are on fire. The nose, the tongue, the body, the brain, or the mind, it's on fire. And it's on fire, he says in this sutra, it's on fire with desire. It wants to see things. The ears want to hear things. The mouth wants to eat things. And so it's as if they're on fire with desire. So what they would speak about is the exhaustion of that craving, the exhaustion of that. And if you had put out the flame of desire, if you put that out entirely, then that's this kind of idea of exhaustion. It's done, it's gone. What this sutra is gonna be trying to get at is there's a sense in which that has already happened or the eye is always already in a state of exhaustion. That's the idea of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that we're deluded. It, it's yeah, exactly. And I'm hoping, yeah, with a few more of these, I think we're gonna be able to get there. Like, you know, 
it, it's all been building up though, like the, these different ideas. Oh, this is one where they decided you didn't want to know. So they took out two stanzas. So after the ultimate exhaustion of the eye, it goes on to say, um, is, if someone is bewildered and doesn't understand the decay and extinction of the eye, then they fall to the level of ordinary common practices. But if someone it clearly understands the decay and extinction of the eye, then they rise above common ordinary practices. So these are related. These are related, but the exhaustion part about it is more about that fading away. And then being exhausted is the, the actual going out. But the one above this was sort of about that that dying of the flame, so to speak. This one is about the actual extinction of the flame, if that makes sense. So they're really parsing out each step of this. And so I actually think it's why they just dropped these two, because <laughs> they were like, isn't that the same? That's the same as the one before that. So let's just <laughs> so screw the buddha we're editing those out you know and there's actually a very subtle difference between those two ideas of the exhaustion which is again more about the idea of the fuel the fuel running out and then the extinction which is the one that is we just dealt with then they pick back up one who is bewildered and doesn't understand the ultimate quiescence of the eye falls to the level of ordinary common practice and will not like this sutra, but one who clearly understands without confusion the ultimate quiescence of the eye has risen above common ordinary practices and will love this sutra. So the ultimate quiescence is any, it's kind of the, even the furthest <laughs> direction we were headed. But what I want you to know is that even though it is sort of with, within the trajectory of the flame going out, the extinguishing of the flame, and then the ultimate quiescence, the ultimate cessation, they are in an order. It's kind of a trajectory in that sense. But the term ultimate quiescence is kind of always Buddhist code for nirvana or nirodha, but you might you can just think of nirvana. And so you can read that, and I would suggest that it's probably the way that it kind of should be read, which is that one who clearly understands kind of the nirvanic state of the eye, the ultimate quiescence of the eye. So that's sort of Again, it's in the same family of the things that we've just been going through. And they are related to the first set that had to do with the past and future, existence, non-existence. So it all has to do with, you know, really, it has to do with one way of thinking about this, which is what the sutra is calling bewildered, confused, and it's kind of a way of thinking about this as happening in time, meaning things arising, things ceasing, things coming into existence, going out of existence, things decaying, things dying. That way of understanding, this sutra is saying is that that's confused. And so when it says if somebody is, is clear, clearly understands the existence and non-existence, the ultimate quiescence of the eye and all of these things. It's talking about somebody who understands the empty nature of the eye in that sense, that the eye is already in a state of peaceful quiescence. It's already in a state of nirvana. And it's a confusion that sort of, well, like that anxiety attack, <laughs> It makes it appear as if the eye is real. And then you can have the sense of it decaying. You can have the sense of it going out of existence and all of that. So 
again, I, I promise you there, it's going to get clearer in a second. They're, they're about to say the, what we needed to say. So the next one is one who is bewildered and doesn't understand that the I does not come and does not go. That person falls to the level of ordinary common practice and will not like this sutra. But one who clearly understands without confusion that the I does not come and does not go, that person has risen above ordinary common practice and will love this sutra. So that language of neither comes nor goes, right? That should sound perfectly like, that should sound right in line with what we've been talking about. Coming into existence, out of existence, right? All of these ideas of motion and change and movement. And when it says being clear and understanding that the eye doesn't come or go, I've only got one, I've only got one great example of things that don't come and go, right? And that's always my, my example of something that doesn't come and doesn't go. So behold <laughs> the fist, right? So the idea here is, is that if you've never seen my magic trick, right? My magic trick looks something like this. Watch the fist. Whoa, watch, watch me. <laughs> So watch me disappear, right? So watch the fist. It's great. So this, sorry. So the idea is, is where did the fist go? Or better yet, watch very carefully. Where did it come from? So if, this is my, I love this example of the fist because look, it's a fist. Behold, it is here. But when I do this and I blow it away, the idea is, well, where did the fist go? Did it go over there? Did it go in my pocket? Did it go where, like, where is it now? And the idea of course, is that the, the molecules, if you will, the particles, that that formally constituted the fist they're all right here so the actual molecular structure that was the fist it's still right here but there's no fist oh there it is so again the idea is, is where did it come from and where does it go and the point is, is that you could search you could search forever to try to find where it went and where it comes from, or you are just aware of the true nature of the fist, which is that it is not a thing like that. It's an idea, it's a construct, it's a notion, it's a form that a perceiver can look at and call an eye or call a fist. This is suggesting that the eyeball is like a fist. It doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. But look, behold, eyes. Look, a fist. And if you can understand that, if you get that, if you're like, oh, I got it. It doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't go from anywhere. But when it be, it be. That idea of when it be, it be is called tathata, suchness. And the idea of suchness is when it be, it be. <laughs> but don't get confused and think it came from somewhere or that it goes anywhere. Because as soon as you do that, you're, you're going to start worrying about dying. Because <laughs> that's the big problem of all of this way of thinking, that we think we came from somewhere, and therefore we are going somewhere. And the idea is, is that that's a way to think about things, but it's maybe not 
true in that sense. Okay, everybody good with the eye not coming or going? Wonderful. One who is bewildered and does not understand the non-self of the eye and the nature of its ultimate exhaustion falls to the level of ordinary common practices and will not like the sutra. Well, one who clearly understands the non-self of the I and the nature of its ultimate exhaustion has risen above ordinary common practices and will love this sutra. Okay, so there we have it. Um, this is where I was hoping to arrive at by the end of the evening was this line about the, no, the non-self of the I. It's why I spent so much time at the beginning talking about no self so that I wouldn't have to do it now. Um, let me really quickly. Uh, yeah, so let's talk for the uh, last bit of our time here about the idea of the non-self of the I. So the language here is a little tricky and it sort of has to do with what I was saying at the beginning. There's a trickiness to the language of no self that, well, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky idea. As I already pointed out, the, the, the idea of the self is already tricky if you go looking for it in that way. But what I'm really getting at is, is that you can understand this term no self sort of two different ways. And, or I, I, I should say this no self of the I that they're talking about, you can understand it two different ways. The, the one way would be very re related to my opening remarks on no self. And that's about the idea that, that these eyes, that that be right in that sense that they could be without being possessed or owned by anybody namely me michael <laughs> meaning you could read this as saying you know i say these are michael's eyes these are my eyes and therefore they are sort of owned or possessed in that way by me by myself. And so you could read this as saying, um, what's the exact language again? Um, being bewildered and not understanding the non-self of the I. So you could understand it as the idea that the I is operating, but without any self actually there as the person who has the I. That's one way to understand it. And I think that's true. I think that's totally, you know, lines up with everything. But I actually think they're going for something a little deeper than that. And I think that they're going for more. And this is where the, the language thing gets really tricky. I would, I would suggest that they're talking about the, the self of the I as being like the, how can I put it? The delineated object that is the I, meaning like the idea of the entity of it, the, the, the ob objective nature of it as an entity, that that's the self of it. And yeah, we have a little time. I'll give you another example since I've been doing lots of examples tonight. So I, I always like to pull out this one, right? So the idea here is, is that you can, and you probably do in your mind, hold this as a single object. And you probably are able to do that because you have a word. You have a single word, a single name called a clock. And so one word, one thing. But as I often like to point out with my 
clock here, there's actually, there's a button here. There's dials back here. It's got a battery. It's got hands, dials, numbers. It's actually a lot of things. And yet the mind can very easily just wrap it up and hold it as a single object. That process, or actually not the process, but that entity, the clock, you could call that the self of the clock. Like it's, 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 it, it gets tricky because, you know, we're not talking about it like it's a person, but the language of self, at least in Sanskrit, it's about being like an individual. Maybe that's a good way to put it. So the sense of individuality, we will even say like, wow, you're a really funny individual, right? That idea of being an individual and that this is an, a one clock, it's, it's in just one. That's the idea of a self the singular nature of it's not singular in other words maybe that clock is just a word like it's just a word and you can't ever actually find a clock in that sense now the real lesson about this selflessness call it the selflessness of all dharmas. The real thing about this teaching is that everything I just said for the clock let's, goes for the battery too. <laughs> See, I did it again. I have a word for what is a multiple, but I can wrap it all up and just say, oh, look, a battery, one thing. That's the self of the battery the individual battery, the one battery. But wait a minute, the battery used to be part of my clock, right? The idea is, is that it's not just the clock that doesn't have a self. Each part of the clock is also an idea. And so it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going in that way. That's the idea of no self. It's about more of this sense of individuality, again, separatedness. And so one who is bewildered and does not understand the, uh, the non-self of the I, the non-individual nature of the I, and the nature of its ultimate exhaustion or that kind of ultimate quiescent, that person falls to ordinary common practices. But one who clearly understands the non-self of the I has risen above ordinary common practices. Okay, so now let's just kind of wrap all of that together. <laughs> so again, they mentioned that everything we talked about regarding the eye goes for the ear, nose, tongue, body, brain, mind, everything, the elements, suffering, everything. And, you know, of course, now that we've kind of gone through this, I hope that you can begin to, uh, or I hope, I actually hope that you're not beginning. <laughs> I hope you're fully understanding how, like, kind of what they're talking about in that way. And what I mean is, is now that we've gone through the eyeball and I've kind of primarily, I feel like the one really important one was the fist one with this idea where you can have the word and you can even see a form, but the nature of that thing, it may not actually have a substantial reality like we think it does. And if you know, if you got my idea of the fist and that the eyeballs are like that too, and then you begin to apply this understanding to the ears, to the nose, to the tongue, to the body, to the mind, 
to to the skandhas, to the four elements, to everything. Of course, the idea is, is that nothing escapes this teaching of no self. And I, again, I'm hoping that you can start to, even if you're just like, cause like, I mean, it happens to me all the time, especially once I've been teaching this, you know, you can start looking around your, like I'm in this room, looking around this room and begin noticing the mind's habit of singularizing things, crimping, kind of crimping them off from their other things. But if you, you know, I, the example that I often like to give regarding this kind of way of seeing is you can take a, um, well, our sutra, you take our book, right? But a book is like a collection of words, right? So any given word, you can isolate as that word, or you could, it's part of the book. But then this book could be on a shelf and be part of a library. But then that library could be on a campus and be part of that university. And that university could be in that city and be part of that town. And the idea here is, is that it's our minds that are at that are stopping at some point and saying, okay, you be a thing. <laughs> okay, no, wait, you stop being your own thing. You be part of these other things, right? Like my fingers as part of my hand. But my hand, it only makes sense when it has fingers. So they're all kind of wrapped up together. But you can just isolate out my fingers or you could do it my hand or it's just all part of me or it's all part of your screen <laughs> and again the idea here is is it's the mind that's able to parse things out but where the mind gets confused is when it forgets it's the one doing that and thinks that these things are actually out there in that way so that's the basic teaching for tonight. And in particular, they focused on the eyeball. Next week, what we're going to get to is, is that if this eyeball doesn't come or go, is beyond existence and non-existence and all of that, then what do we do with light in that kind of worldview? <laughs> when normally we're thinking about these as the sensors of light. So... So stay tuned for that next week. Um, hope you all have a beautiful week.